Well, welcome to another edition, special edition of The Cutting Room Floor, a podcast uh, of Harbor Church where we try to go a little deeper in the sermon that was just preached on Sunday. Uh, my name is Seth Winterhalter, and today is my last Sunday as the lead pastor of Harbor Church, so this will be um, at least the last time I'm on this podcast in this capacity. There you go. Go around the horn. Yeah. Uh, I'm across from Seth. I'm Sean Williard, the executive pastor. Steve Thompson, biblical families pastor. Caleb Stone, regular old volunteer pastor. <laughs> regular young <laughs> volunteer pastor. You ain't old. The one who have more jewels than us all. That's right. Yep, that's right. Yeah. So uh, we've been walking through the Gospel of Mark, and I think we've only done one other podcast so far. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now we'll we'll do our second. Yeah. And... There haven't been a ton of questions. You've just been so clear, and Mark's just pretty uh, pretty easy to handle. So uh, there we go. Not yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah. We've been taking smaller chunks. They have been. And so I think that helps yep. uh, kind of... Yep, trying to figure out the message of what Mark's saying here. But there was one question from a couple of weeks ago. So just to set the scene, uh, you were preaching about the story of the paralytic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just to remind our audience, it's the story where Jesus is in the the house and crowds are trying to gather around him and people can't get in. So they bring the paralytic and they they dig through the roof and lower him down. Uh, And Jesus forgives the man's sins and the Pharisees are there. And, you know, it's easy to forgive sins or tell us men to stand up and walk. And up comes the man and... You know, everyone's amazed and such. Mm-hmm. But there's an interesting take here that has kind of confounded people for a long time, thinking about those friends and their faith. Uh, what what the text says, at least in the ESV, this is Mark uh, chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 5. So they lowered the man down, and it says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, your sin, or sorry, son, your sins are forgiven. So the question comes in about that their faith it seemed like at least maybe the interpretation from your sermon maybe you emphasized that these people had faith and the question is well jesus seen their faith is that what forgave their sins like Mm -hmm. does jesus look at my faith and forgive other people or or how does all that work with jesus forgiving sins the faith of these people our text how's all that play out that's good so i think uh, maybe let's set the stage of a few things first we have to understand that jesus's ministry is hyper unique it is not our ministry Right. We do not mirror the ministry of Jesus. Jesus' ministry was an incarnative work where, again, he incarnates in human form to be the second Adam. So he has to incarnate uh, and take on. He can't just be a, a, a figure that's like humanity. He's got to be in our flesh so that he can live perfectly and then attribute us that righteousness. So he does that before his ministry. So really his, his his life leading up to his ministry is a life just like ours that is tempted, is is able to sin, walks through the various challenges and realities of human life in light of a sinful world. So Adam didn't have that. Adam didn't fall within a sinful world. He fell in a perfect world and brought sin to the world, right? The uniqueness. So I, I say that to say uh, Jesus, uh, then when he starts his ministry, uh, after his baptism, is a unique. It, what does he say? The kingdom is at hand. Jesus now is 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 giving a picture through his ministry of the proclamation of the kingdom is now. Because why why is the well, what what makes the kingdom at hand more so with Jesus um, than anyone else? Well, it's because he's the Son of God. Right. He mm-hmm. is the King of Kings. He is the D- Davidic King who will reign and rule forever. And so everything changes with Jesus' incarnation. Why? Because he's not here to be a king. That's what's interesting. He's not here to be the the king of kings and rule in the seat of the Roman Empire. He's here to deal with the spiritual so that then he can deal with the physical. Uh, we, we, we always want the physical, right? We want the physical blessings of empire. And he's like, you got to deal with the heart condition first. You got to deal with your soul. Let's redeem that. And then we'll... Um, will we'll do the final then the kingdom will come in its fullness i, I was going to just say I, you said something there yeah yeah he, Help he me. is able to sin i think i think i don't think you meant to say that quite oh, sure. like that yeah because G- obviously jesus didn't sin and, no he didn't sin. yeah yeah but he but he, again i it, told you i was going to just correct you and you should have. Your last one. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he could have he could have kind of i mean that's the that's the age-old debate right could jesus have, 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 have actually sinned well if he couldn't have sinned mm. then he can't sympathize with us but so he could have mm. But he can't because he's because he's God. Yeah. 
Yeah, he can't because he's got yeah. So uh, well, so so here's the way. Uh, this is the mystery of the hypostatic union, it right? Is the Touching his yeah. divinity, no, he's. It's not possible for him to sin. It's impossible. Touching his humanity, he's tempted like us in every way, in but every without way. sin. Yes. So how do those two natures work in one thing? Yeah. Pastor Steve, if you can enlighten us on that <laughs> and, and solve the age-old mystery, we would love that. Thank well, you. I don't think we have to solve that mystery necessarily. No. He, no. He, it is a it is a mystery, and, and uh, yeah. I mean, he's got you know he, he's got he never that he, he didn't he, he didn't cease being god he no, right 100 yeah. but i i i just for the sake of the audience yes, if, if yeah. they you know he we want to make sure they didn't think that he sin, he potentially sinned no no uh, yeah well yeah, yeah he, so, he doesn't sin which is why yeah. he gives us his perfect righteousness <clears throat> right so his so the point is i'm taking my way just winding through you are uh, yeah <laughs> but this is good someone will chew on this and think it, you have to understand, therefore, that Jesus's ministry is uniquely different. So Peter, so if you look at Peter's ministry or Paul's ministry, mm -hmm. it does not mirror Jesus's ministry. They didn't, Peter didn't go around on his preaching tours, healing people. Now, did people get healed? Sure. There were some pretty radical moments, mm -hmm. but that wasn't, it, it does not mirror at all Jesus's ministry. Great crowds did not follow him to be healed uh, on a regular ongoing basis like, like Jesus did. Because Jesus is the picture of the kingdom, and we are still a picture of the kingdom. Should should we experience supernatural healing? Should we experience demons uh, that are oppressing people being right Exercised. cast out? I would say that 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 I would I would I would say uh, should we see that on the regular? I don't necessarily think so. But if we don't see it at all, I don't know. Are we a full picture of the kingdom? That's a good question to ask. And, and so uh, I think that's why we say we're we're. Um, we believe in the spirit who's able to do all things. And I get really nervous when people are like, Oh, I don't know, because that seems like, uh, because of the abuses of char charismania mm -hmm. that we're, who, who again would say, no, this should be regular occurrence. When I say that doesn't, that sounds like G you want to be Jesus. You want to, you want to be in the kingdom right now with all those things eradicated. And that's not the reality of, of the world. That's why we long for him to come back because we still live in a sinful, corrupt world. And so, like I said today, this advent, this hope, this longing, we should be fasting now because we miss the reality of Jesus in his earthly life uh, and those amazing moments of what it means to live under the king uh, who eradicates all sin. So now we get to the text. In light of that then, when Jesus looks up above and says, uh, when he sees their faith, you have to ask two things. What faith though? Their faith in what? Because Jesus hasn't died for sin yet. Mm -hmm. So he's not, they're not like, they saw his faith to forgive this. Like it makes no correlation to when he says, son, your sins are forgiven. They're probably like, that's not what we asked. We asked for you to heal him, right? So Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So let's be careful not to attribute a saving faith uh, that saves from sin to this man, because that's not the context whatsoever. His friends are bringing him for physical healing. And Jesus, um, they, they they know that Jesus, who's been doing this, uh, is that. So their faith can't be a um, a saving faith because that's not the context. And and so that'd be the first thing I would think about, yeah. right? And then the next is, but 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 clarify something for me. Yes. You're not saying that because people didn't see Jesus die on the cross yet that they were not saved, forgiven of their sins, or or saved by God or anything like that. You're not saying that, are you? I'm saying that even in the Old Testament, yeah. people had, they would trust in God yeah. for their hope from sin. It yeah. still had to mm -hmm. do with sin. Yeah. Right? The Day of Atonement. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. can't just want God because you want to be freed from a physical, the sinful physical realities yeah. okay. of life. I see what Does you're saying. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's all spiritual. Yeah. So just because you don't know, you can't put your faith in Jesus because he died for sin because you don't know Jesus yet. Gotcha. Uh, yes, and that's not faith. What but, you're saying is from the context, these people are looking for a healing. They're not looking for forgiveness of sins. They're looking for this man to be healed. Well, I would, I don't, I would, that would be a hard stretch, uh, I think, for the text when they're doing everything to get a physical person who can't physically get to Jesus in front of physically Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And so just, and, and they don't, and that's why even the crowd is like, Forgiveness of sins. And the Pharisees are like, what? And then Jesus goes, well, what's it easier to say? Mm -hmm. So he, again, Jesus knows what he wants, what he, mm -hmm. how he wants to frame a conversation. Mm -hmm. And he's looking for the opportunity to drop it. Here it is. And so we, that's where I would say we have to be careful then. And, and I think what, other, what else looks to this, Jesus over throughout the Gospels has moments like this. They're not, they're not 
all the time. They're, they're infrequent, so that's another thing. If something's infrequent, we should be careful to make a theology out of it. But we do see Jesus like the woman with the blood issue. She reaches out and touches the hem of his garment, mm-hmm. and he turns around and goes, who, who touched me? Right? He feels like power going out from him. It, it was I, uh, your faith has made you. Right? Your faith has made. Okay, what's her faith in? Well, her faith isn't in Jesus to forgive her sins. Her faith is in the miracle worker, the healer of a physical reality. So what faith, so that would be a weird pull for us to say, hey, if you if you believe in Jesus will deliver you from cancer, then your sins are forgiven. Sure. Like <laughs> no one would, mm-hmm. no one of any religion would argue that, right? I, th- I think it's that. And yet we kind of see this, well, where do we see this distortions? We see it in the Catholic church. We see it specifically in Mormonism where they baptize you uh, for your dead relatives that mm-hmm. didn't get baptized. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's now we're taking sections of scripture that go, see, if you do a, um, God will look at your faith mm-hmm. and he will transfer that spiritually to these other people. Mm-hmm. And I think that is such a, a chasm of weirdness. We, we've jumped the shark because we haven't looked at really like a context of a, and so he's honoring their faith, but it's not a saving faith. It's a faith that's looking to Jesus. It's looking to him, but it's not looking to him again for savior of sin. It's looking for him, for the king to ratify the realities of sin, which live really in the physical world. Uh, this issue is a physical issue. The woman with blood is a physical issue. Uh, the other one I can think of is the the man who comes to Jesus to heal his daughter. And mm-hmm. he goes, come to me. I'll go to your house. And he goes, you don't need to come to my house. Uh, just you say the word and I know she'll be healed mm-hmm. because of your faith. She's been healed. So all of them are physical conditions. None of them have anything to do with spirituality or spiritual sin. And so just because Jesus says the word sins are forgiven, I think to attribute that then to their faith would be a, a stretch for me. So just to just to speak that back, you're saying they are looking for probably physical healing. Jesus mm-hmm. is doing his own thing. They're, these people aren't coming looking to Jesus to be like, man, we need this guy's sins to be forgiven. Mm-hmm. But Jesus knows underlying what is more important, what is uh, more necessary for this man, that his, his spiritual sins would be forgiven, that he'd be set right with God. Yes. And then as a result, the miracle is he's healed, he's healed physically. Yes. But that's the people there are looking for physical stuff. But Jesus knows what's really going on. And underneath I, and i would say because it's connected and it's not just connected it's he is a paralytic because of sin now we could we can argue we don't know is it his sin sure is it the sins of his parents mm-hmm. is it the sin of culture mm-hmm. context rolling sin mm-hmm. we have no idea mm-hmm. but it's definitely a cause of sin because all things in physical mental emotional uh unraveling are a result of sin. That's not the way God wired us. Uh, there will be none of that in, in the new heaven and the new earth. Mm-hmm. So we can say, what then what is the deductive reality of that? It's because of sin. So that's why, again, I say, why I kind of backed us up. Jesus comes to deal with sin, whereas uh, even his own disciples were like, is now the time for you to make, you know, even after he, he resurrects from the dead, is now the time? Is the kingdom of heaven, you know, when, when are you going to get around with the, physic- with the physical mm-hmm. version of and this and and Jesus is like patience my friends mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so and it just to encourage now, now to help us we do the same thing if you if you looked if we I would love one day we'll, we'll all be like uh Elon Musk will have the the discs inside of our head right <laughs> the and Neuralink we, whatever the it Neuralink, is the we, can, we can shoot up <laughs> all of our thoughts for the week that won't that be fun for the church uh what if we what if we could put up on a projector every prayer that everyone in the room said during the week what do you think the percentage of them would be physical realities versus spiritual oh a ton 75 80 percent probably more probably more yeah i would i would take 85 or more i might even be tempted to take the 90 or more yeah i I would include circumstantial prayers in that too it's by physical circumstances either either a you know, uh, pain or something wrong or just something wrong with John. my cir- yeah. Yeah, circumstance. Exactly. Direction on this decision. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Some kind of physical, non-spiritual, <clears throat> not not a um, th- sin. Yeah. Um, I want to grow in righteousness. Grow in sanctification, or, mm-hmm. yeah. right? And so if we can't, we who are, we who can read backwards mm-hmm. on the text, who know the entire word of God, who live this out, who are under its preaching, under its teaching, if we can't even get it right, like we just are so rooted to the physical and praise be to God. God is, is into the physical too. 
because um, sometimes we can write the uh, Gnostics slash um, e- even today, like the idea of it's, you're just spirit mm-hmm. and that's false because we will have a literal resurrection of our physical bodies. So God cares about the physical too, because he made it and because he's going to restore it, not just your soul. And so we should, we should care about both, but that's the order. I think we get, we put so much stock in the physical because it's right here and we don't in the spiritual, which is actually the, the deeper, that, that's why we live such shallow lives. Mm-hmm. And so. Yeah. Anyway, I hope that way, you know, you listen to a lot of, of, of interesting talk. How do you apply it to life? And I would say that's how we apply. Like their faith is the activity. God is honoring. Jesus is looking at their actions. You, you saw me for what I could do. And that is I could alleviate this physical handicap. And so you went above and beyond to go through many obstacles because you loved your friend, I guess, because there's some kind of care and compassion there that drove them to, right, get to the top of a building, through a crowd, cut a hole in the roof, figure out how to lower them down. I mean, that's for that time and day, that's that's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, at their cost, physical, uh, financial. I mean, they got to fix a roof now. So, uh, I think Jesus is honoring the actions of their belief. So. And and just you uh, brought it out in your sermon, but are, are we a people who are like that, who will stop mm-hmm. at nothing to get people in front of Jesus mm-hmm. for their needs, for their healing, for the forgiveness of their sins, which is even more important, mm-hmm. which Jesus was saying. That's the thing I've been chewing on the last couple of weeks as mm-hmm. you preached that. Are we those type of people? Yeah. Yep. Well, cool. Well, let's let's uh, unless you guys have other thoughts on that, let's move on to the to today's text. Um, yeah. So today you're preaching about uh, this this question about fasting. John's disciples fast. Pharisees fast, Jesus, your your disciples don't fast. What's going on there? And he talks about the bridegroom and such. Mm. And you mentioned today about the bridegroom, um, and, and you said we take that up on the Cutter Room Floor podcast here. So just to ask the question, what's going on with this bridegroom language, imagery, and are they supposed to know something about that? Or, mm. or what's what's Jesus saying in all of this? Yeah, the thing I just wanted to point out is I'm reading a lot of uh, commentaries and text is sometimes we can read, when you read the... Um, when you read the gospel specifically, it you read it is you have this narrative story going on in their characters, right? Jesus is a he's a good guy, right? Mm-hmm. The Pharisees are bad guys in the story. Oh, bad guys, right? And so what happens is is we in in the crowd, they're kind of like, well, we gotta kinda of figure this out, mm-hmm. right? Um and there's disciples, and they're the follower of the good guy, right? So they gotta be good guys. So what happens is we can identify with who we want to be in the story. So we're like, well, I can't be Jesus. <laughs> he gets taken. But man, I'm going to be a disciple. And at worst, I'm going to be in the crowd. So at least I'm close to Jesus, right? I'd never be a Pharisee. But the problem is <laughs> a lot of us are Pharisees. And especially if you're a Christian, I would encourage you, if you've been a Christian for more than five, 10 years, you're most likely going to uh, wrestle with the things the Pharisees wrestled with. And if you don't see that, you're not being honest. Mm. And you're not allowing the text to help you. You are becoming self-righteous like a Pharisee. So uh, I think, and why I say that is, sometimes we can then beat up the Pharisees. And we can say, oh, there's all these signs. How did you not know? And one of these could be like this text where Mm. Jesus says, you know, uh, can the wedding uh, guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away and they will fast in that day. He's speaking of himself in a way here that we can look back and go, see, he's speaking of himself because we know that Jesus is taken away. He ascends to the Father, and now the disciples fast. We can understand that. They would have no context. No one. The Pharisees don't. The disciples don't. And even remember the disciples. The disciples, when you look at them up into the crucifixion, they're dimwits. They're like, <laughs> Jesus is all the time like, seriously? Like, are you are you this Gives stupid? Gives me hope. Right? That's right. <laughs> I mean, so much so Jesus, after he resurrects from the dead, sticks around for like 40 days to have to teach them again. And they're like, all of a sudden the light bulb's going off. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, oh, really? Like, wow. Uh, okay. And even even then, Matthew 28, right right before the Great Commission, my favorite verse probably in the whole Bible because it's so astounding to me. It says, even then some didn't believe. Mm. What? Mm-hmm. The dude's walking through walls and you know, <laughs> what is going on here? And so... uh. We have to be careful when we look back into this that what we can see today and go see Jesus as the bridegroom that we don't expect them to see it because they didn't. And, and it, when you read commentaries, you see like um, 
they had there was no uh, there's no historical connection between Messiah and the word bridegroom. We have that connection today because mm-hmm. we call Jesus the bridegroom. Uh, we have Revelation uh, where he's called that all the time. Um, they had none of that. They had none. It's the same thing uh, in what we just talked about. When it says your sins are forgiven, they have no understanding in Old Testament texts that the Messiah will forgive sin. That's not an expectation of Messiah. He has a lot of other expectations, um, but mm-hmm. that's not one of them. And so when he says that, we we go, oh, see, he's showing he's the Messiah. And, and again, we're attributing that because we know the fullness of what we call Messiah, but right. that wouldn't have been Old Testament understanding. So we just have to, uh, we just have to give a break sometimes to, uh, are the Pharisees bad guys? Yeah. Self-righteously, Jesus calls them out on it, but just be careful. You don't so demonize them that you actually attribute things to their foolishness that aren't actually attributable. Uh, Cause then I think what we do is we, we can just, we don't get out of the text, uh, what, the, what is actually there and what is real. So that's my own. Yeah. But it would, so would you say it's bad to look to the end of the story and then reinterpret the beginning of the story? Like reading it today, we should know, we should see Jesus as the bridegroom, right? Yes. Yes. We can do that. And we can be, we can go, um, yes, he is the bridegroom and see, he's speaking to himself there. We can say that all day long and that's a win for us. What's wrong is to go, uh, all the Pharisees, he, Jesus is saying it and you're not understanding it. See, you guys are, you guys are cold hearted. (laughs) <laughs> they are, but it's not because of that. Does that make sense? That sounds pharisaical in itself. <laughs> what does? <laughs> that you're you're cold hearted. You guys don't get it. You're not as righteous as me because I understand. Because I understand. Going on that's what that's you're what being I'm, a Pharisee in that moment. <laughs> that, exactly. That's what I'm kind of saying. So so it's even today. Like how, what would be a good like so today we can look back on people in 2000 mm-hmm. and go you you made some really poor decisions. Even see this. Y2K. You even see this in politics today. It's like, oh, you you thought that way. You you know, like this whole woke movement to demonize anyone who's ever had a bad thought in their whole life. Mm-hmm. It's like we're gonna go through Twitter and find. It's like, why don't we start with you? Like, why don't we hear the words of Jesus to go, you who cast the first stone, you're the first Twitter we're gonna go through. Uh, because it's just it's just it, it's unfair to look backwards and hold people to that to today's. I find this even in scripture where we look back at Genesis and we go, oh, like, how can people believe this? Mm-hmm. How can, and it's like, it wasn't written to you, you dimwit. That's why you know, you're, you live into the 21st century. Jesus, Jesus isn't even right on the page for mm-hmm. 2000 years. Like this is, this is God speaking to a untechnological, un, you know, a, a super, supernatural to the hilt. Uh, people who think the the stars above them are magic, and so let's let's give them a little grace. Let's give the text a little grace, uh, because God again isn't writing to you; He's writing to them. And praise be to God, He we can we can read it today and still understand uh, God's goodness and His grace. So that's what I mean. Just be careful how you read back, and and we praise be to God, we get to read and understand the full picture. But be careful of of how you treat the people who who have gone before you, mm. and maybe they're their um unintelligence or their because we'll we will be looked at as just as stupid mm-hmm. in a hundred years mm-hmm. people will look at us and go wow like c.s lewis called that the chronological snobbery right exactly. <clears throat> looking back and being oh we're we're so much more sophisticated and better than them yeah being <clears throat> those idiots yeah yeah so you made it so that makes me think you you said in your sermon today you were talking about tone yeah, and and how we how we viewed the words of Jesus and other people in the text and the tone there, um, which made me think about eisegesis. Mm. So we tried to exegesis here. We're mm. bringing out of the text was actually there. Mm-hmm. Eisegesis would be the reverse process, reading into the text things that we're bringing there, mm-hmm. and that whole tone conversation was was made me reflect on that because we can bring our interpretations of stuff. How do we see Jesus? Will we read that into the text? that may not be what's there mm. and we may import some sort of meaning that's not actually from the words there in the, in yep. the bible so my question is what do i do with that mm. how do i how do i take my my understandings of jesus my experience in my life the tone that i think he's speaking with because if i'm a if i'm like judgment type of guy then i'm gonna see jesus words as judgment all the mm. time or if i'm a uh, just Jesus, just love. God is love. We need to accept everyone. I'm going to read that into the story of Jesus. How do I fight against that in my own life, my own reading of scripture? I think first, just be aware, be aware that you do it because we, we do it with everything that we take in the, I think the da- the biggest danger in the Bible is a narrative because when you read a narrative, you frame, we're just 
humans are storytellers and storytelling is nuanced by tone. And so like, I think the, the biggest book of this is Jonah. When you read Jonah, it just, it's so, it's so short mm -hmm. and it's so um, condemning <laughs> Uh, that it's easy to have tone in that. And so I, I would encourage you, Joe, to be a good exercise. Read that through like four times and be mindful of your tone. Change your tone. Mm -hmm. Change the way that you nuance your reading of it. And, and the other thing is read slowly. I think when you, if you're reading fast, uh, because I'm a kind of a fast reader, I find that I default to whatever is my natural tone. And the slower I have to read something, uh, I'm more aware of it. I'm mm -hmm. more aware of it. Like, I think I'm kind of reading into that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how do I know what tone's right? That, that's, you know, I think you have to, that's why we have to do exegesis. We have to go, what is the text really saying? And, and what is, this is also where you have to do two things. You have to do careful exegesis, but you, this is why you have to also know the whole narrative of the story. Mm -hmm. That's why I said today, God is a God of joy. Uh, he is, when you read through the scriptures, there's joy. He wouldn't be doing this if he was, if there was no joy in him. Uh, heaven ring sings with joy. And so uh, I think knowing the bigger picture of who God is helps you then frame. If you think God is is angry, then why would he be a God of grace and mercy? It doesn't make sense. Now, does he have anger against unrighteousness? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But to read an edge to his tone as his natural cadence doesn't make any sense uh, in terms of how he tells us who he is in Exodus uh, 34. And in light of what he does uh, in throughout human history, um, and so I think that's where you just be careful. And, and and again, the text may help you there too because it may like when he's overturning the the tables in the temple. I don't think he's with joy. I don't think he was skipping. Right? <laughs> that would be a real like you say. But I want him to be joyful. So all right. of a sudden, he right he's got his you know his color coded whip and he's hey frolicking through the temple. <laughs> yeah, and, like whoopsie, hey guys. <laughs> like, I, I think that would be a misinterpretation <laughs> radically. Uh -huh. But to, but to also to also because I've seen it used this way to see him as just some macho like I'm just tearing things up and this is bravado. I also think that's inappropriate. I think he was absolutely grieved. The, a house of worship and delight is a house of mockery and financial gain. And so how do you, what would righteousness look like in that? Okay. That now, now I'm getting closer to the tone mm. because he's righteous mm -hmm. and he's not, he's not having a, he's not acting like I would out of just frustration and, and sinful anger, right? He is, he's pure. So how, man, how, what would that look like? He'd be grieved. Uh, but he'd also cast it out. Because mm -hmm. it have to stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to think on that, right? So look at the con let the context also. Like, there's so many moments in the gospel where Jesus. Think about this: how how compassionate is Jesus? Right? Woman, a woman caught in adultery is brought to him. Mm -hmm. All these moments where he, he's talking with a woman at a well, and and he's talking. Now, what's interesting? Actually, um, I heard a great sermon once on John four. Mm -hmm. John the woman at the well. John four is the woman at the well and uh, Nicodemus. Right? Isn't that's John, chapter three. Or is it chapter yeah. three? Okay, so it's that three. That goes right after. Yeah. That's right. So the sermon's on chapter three and four. Mm -hmm. And whoever preached, I can't remember, was talking about look he goes, look at the tone with with the woman who's uh, a Samaritan mm -hmm. who is obviously living a sinful life, non religious. He is so gentle and compassionate with her. And yet with Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, who's a religious leader, mm -hmm. he has kind of a harshness to him, a firmness, I would say. And so that's interesting. Yeah. He, he has two different tones in two different chapters around two different people. And I think that tells you why, why would, was, was, was that now? I think that tells you more about uh, less about Jesus and his personality and more about how we need to be mindful. Like, I don't think the com soft compassion would have spoken to the, to gotten through the layers of Nicodemus. Right. Whereas the woman didn't need that. It would have actually crushed her. She needed compassion because she, her life was already a disaster. So, and so I, th so I think, um, when you read Jesus's tone, be mindful of that, but also be mindful of your tone. Like, are, is your tone set up to the context of the situation for us to produce the most fruit? And I think we have to be careful of that because as more reformed people, we're going to side on the truth, right? Paul says, speak the truth in love. And what we hear is truth. <laughs> and, and we think, well, love means to be truthful instead of, <laughs> it also means to be compassionate right. and to be caring and to be gentle, the fruit of the spirit, right? Gentle and kind. And I think we sometimes have a problem with that. I'll just speak for myself. I have a problem with that. 
Um, whereas, okay, but the other side of the pendulum, let's be gentle and kind and well, we'll kind of blur the truth. Well, that's a problem too, yeah. right? So how do we do both? Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, in, in both cases with Nicodemus and the woman, there, there was kind of the same objective. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he did expose this woman's sin. He yeah. just did it in a, in a way that was gentler than, than Nicodemus, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, he was not, uh, didn't shy away from exposing her sin. In anything, and, and he never does that. Yeah. Right, It's exactly, important yeah. to remember that. So. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to add that too. It's just so, and, and you've already said this, but it's just so important to understand the context of what is going on. So, you know, reading the passage before and the passage after, maybe even reading the, the, the whole book, um, you know, as much as you can and taking a look at the individual context and culture of where you're at, but also the overall narrative of the Bible will help kind of uh, tell you what's going on there so that you're not jumping from taking the text and just applying it personally without understanding the culture and what's really going on there. But if you're just reading it for yourself and, and, and you maybe have that angry landlord view of God that he's, you know, that he's mad all the time, you're likely to read it and do eisegesis and put something in there that's not really there and apply it to yourself before really knowing what's going on there. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there too. Okay, you might just cut the podcast here, but we'll see. <laughs> Should we pause? We go. Pause for dramatic effect. I pause for go. dramatic effect. <laughs> I think there's something too that we have to understand. This is why you know, like my Bible has red letters, yeah, right? and I try to avoid red letter editions, sure. Um, only because of this, we we can highlight then. Uh, oh, oh, red letters are more important. Mm-hmm. God speaks throughout His whole thing. Mm-hmm. Everything is equal. Mm-hmm. There's also something too about the Gospels that I think we have to be careful. These, um, while these could actually be the very words of Jesus, they also aren't don't need to be the very words of Jesus. These people are captured a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, they 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 were not uh, what, what do you call it, the court stenographers, stenographers mm-hmm. right? They, they're not following Jesus, writing down his exact words. The Sermon on the Mount was most likely hours long. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters. It would take you 20 minutes. It's not a 20 minute sermon. And so, uh, so I think that's where we have to, Jesus said a lot more mm-hmm. that's in this book. And, 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 and so there's, we have to ask ourselves, why did Mark, and Mark's a great gospel to do this with because it's the action gospel. He is, he's giving you the bare minimum to give you exactly what you need to respond. And so let, let's just be careful that you don't, you don't you don't get hung up and go no that's exactly what Jesus says so I got to treat this like these are the only words Jesus said in this moment and this is this is it does that make sense like uh, because be, there Jesus did uh, whether he said these exact words or he said or this is the boiled down version of it this is what God chose to give us in His Word. Uh, and so there is enough here to let us know, to be able to know who God is, to be able to know how to respond, to be able to know our sinful condition and our righteous condition in him. So uh, I just sometimes I think that people, uh, they, they read it like, no, these this is exactly what he says. And so in this, is so, so there's some magical, like, it's kind of like the magical key, right? If I just frame the words correctly, perfectly, I'll unlock the magic secrets. And it's like, first, I think you're treating the text in, in a way that actually isn't what the text is. Um, it's what well, we do this in revelation too. If I just figure out what the coding, you know, mm-hmm. these are Apache helicopters and this is, and I'm like, you, you're, you're reading. So, and I think sometimes ex- exegetical preaching, this is where exegetical preaching goes wrong. Um, I get nervous sometimes when guys I appreciate are like, you know, I'm going to preach on the first three words of this verse today. And I'm like, I don't think. I I would have a hard time thinking Mark was like, I hope they preach the three words of my first chapter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying you can't find something there. I'm not saying you can't be blown away with the truth there. But, but at the same time, I think we have to be careful to break it so down and put so much meaning like this is what God, oh, God meant exactly this in this small selection of verses. I don't know. I, I, I think we have to be careful there. I think all God's word is going to glorify him. All God's word has something to say to us. So whether we take it in big chunks or small chunks, uh, that's okay. But let's just be careful to say, this is what Mark meant in these five verses in his second chapter. Mark's not here. So I want to be careful. I want to go, this is what I draw out when I look at these few verses in light of the whole of scripture and in light of 
specifically Mark's gospel, this is what pops out to me. And that's how we divide text, right? Because it's not like we go to seminary and they give us like, mm-hmm. if you're going to preach Mark, there's 13 sermons. Yeah. Like I've heard, you know, 52 sermons on Mark and I've heard four. So right. What, what's right? Well, it doesn't, you're not, you divide the text however you want it, but just be careful if someone says the text only says one thing. Says who? Because I don't, God didn't say that. He didn't say, hey, when you preach my text, make sure to cut it up this way or make sure you only have one big idea and there's only one big idea. I, I just, I think we have to be careful there. And I say that because I hope that the big idea that I've, I've pulled out in my sermon is, is an idea that is, is in scripture. That is an idea that we can pull from that text and is faithful to that text. And at the same time, if you preach that text and saw something else in there, Mm-hmm. I would hope that we go, man, I see that in that text too. And yeah. praise God for his word. Yeah. And, and so uh, I just, I, I, and why do I say that? Because I want you when you read the Bible to go, man, God speak to me. Because I don't have to go to mm-hmm. a pastor to make sure I got the big idea right. Uh, I think God wants to speak to you and however much you read of his word, he's going to reveal truth. And and if you have questions, good. Like that, that question, man, does this mean that faith is attributable? Man, that's a great question. Let's chew on that. Let's mm-hmm. look at the whole of Scripture. Mm-hmm. And once you start to read the New Testament, you're like, oh, well, Peter doesn't kind of think that. Paul doesn't kind of think that. James doesn't kind of think that. And so what would that tell me? There must be something unique that Jesus is doing here. Because if it was doctrine, you mm-hmm. would see that replicated throughout mm-hmm. the church. Yeah, I think that uh, even uh, I think in particular, I, I'm thinking of like the Old Testament passages where you you know you you're look you should be looking and say well, who who is God in this passage, and then, um, and it 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 is I mean he is writing to a specific people at a specific time, mm-hmm. um, and so, um, we w- but but we can take that and and look and see who God is, and we can apply that to very various areas of our lives. So, um, you know, a, a single passage that, you know, could be applied to a husband and how he treats his wife or how, how a father treats his son based upon what we see God's character in that mm-hmm. passage. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and we have a tendency, I think, to, um, see the, the Bible is just, you know, um, it's just written for, you, you see a specific passage, it just means this mm-hmm. and you got to follow that. And, um, but um, it, it it is written to specific people. We got to be careful that we don't just say, "Well, it's um, it, you know, it means this to me." Exactly. Kind That's the, the op- danger. Yeah, yeah, the opposite the, side of that is, "Oh, yeah. it just means this to me." But but the the you know, there's this big storyline in mm-hmm. all of Scripture, and 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 we got to interpret Scripture in light of that big that big storyline, yeah. and then we can we actually can apply that in many areas of our lives, yeah. um, and so. So we don't have to, as as a as a father or husband, we don't have to look for specific verses on, on you know, being a husband or a father. We can look for a variety of passages throughout Scripture that tell us about who God is and His character, yep. and and how we can emulate that character. And you know, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. But Absolutely, it, yeah. I, I think to summarize, <clears throat> you can we can get the Bible right. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and and the Bible has a lot to say that mm-hmm. is right, and so that's why we study it. And we read it over and over and over. We meditate on it. We memorize it because it has plenty to say about who God is, about who we are, and how we respond Mm -hmm. uh, to a holy God. You can also get the Bible really wrong. And like you say, that's part of that, that hyper individual. The spirit lives in me, so I get to whatever I think about the Bible is right. Yeah. Sorry. Eh. (laughs) Like you have failed. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can be very wrong. And in fact, I've heard more wrong, just absolute weirdness about the Bible than I have truth, which is really sad. Tells you something about the American culture today. So, the, but that's why we have the church, right? That's mm-hmm. why we do one anothering. I admonish and I encourage, and that should part of that should be about our understanding of the Bible. That's why in our life groups we talk about the sermon. Why? Because I want to hear us talk about how we apply the Bible to our lives to hold each other accountable to go. Uh, I don't think that's. I don't know. I want to. I want to encourage you there. I don't mm-hmm. think that's probably a healthy uh, way to think mm-hmm. about that. Uh, Mm -hmm. we should be pushing back because that's the only way we sharpen one another, right? Mm -hmm. If we're just like, oh, that's a pretty interpretation. (laughs) I think that's kind of crazy, but this is what I got out of it, (laughs) right? We're we're wielding dull swords, you know, being Mm -hmm. worthless for the world. So let us uh, encourage one another and admonish one another when when that's needed, all for the sake of wanting to know truth, Mm -hmm. right? And so we can live the truth. 
I, th I think another area where we see this is if you line up Matthew, Mark, and Luke together, and you've got a lot of the same different stories yeah. going on in there, but each author gives a different viewpoint sometimes. It almost says something different or adds like a different um, detail to it. So mm -hmm. like I think about asking it will be given in uh, Matthew 7. I think you you line up that with, I think it's Luke 11, where you have the same thing going on where where the Lord says, you know, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And then you look at Luke and it says, how, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit mm. to those who ask him? And it's not like there's completely different meaning there, but you just get more out of it when you can look yeah. at you know, what each gospel is saying from different viewpoints of different authors. Yep. And then you can take the, the big truth out of all that together. A, a great example of that is Luke's Sermon on the Mount is very short. Mm -hmm. And it's very, um, you can read that and be very um, practical, like, blessed are the poor. That's Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay, now, Matthew's is a very spiritual world, mm -hmm. and Luke's is a very Gentile world. And it's still the same spiritual message, but you could read Luke and not understand that and go, wait a minute, what, what, what's going on here? It, is this just physical realities? And so, yeah, you have the praise be to God. We have four gospels, yeah. um, three synoptics and then crazy John, crazy but, John, but, uh, <laughs> that, that's a gift to us. That's not, you know, people are like, Oh, four, they, they, they have discrepancies. And it's like, dude, if you took, if you took all four of us and took a, if we, if we each wrote a one page paper on what happened today in the gathering, mm -hmm. It'd be totally That's different. different. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And would they be wrong? No, they'd be subjective to our viewpoint, what we wanted to get across, what we thought was important, right? And so, and together though, the beauty is they'd frame a better picture. Yeah. And that's what we treat. We yeah, and the differences in the Gospels are purposeful. They're, they're divinely yeah. decreed divinely. by God. They're mm -hmm. not... They're they're not this just uh, random sort of well they just you know they were just different they were they were they were divinely decreed by the by the spirit for a, for a very specific purpose for and, the audience and, that they yeah. were written for yeah right yeah. that's the other thing too uh, we we're blessed by them today but that's the other thing sometimes we look and we go oh because I can understand it because I can understand maybe those nuances mm -hmm. we go oh it's a problem it's like mm -hmm. again you didn't live two thousand years ago. You weren't Matthew writing to a specific audience mm -hmm. with the truth that he was. Again, Matthew wasn't like, God, you're speaking to me. Okay, I'm writing. He's writing, uh, mm -hmm. loving God, wanting to wanting to tell the story. And yet he doesn't know that he's, you, you know. Um, mm -hmm. He's going to pen the Bible? Yeah, going to pen a, a book of the Bible. He doesn't even know what the Bible even that, that means, right? Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, and you you know you think about the, the what is the title of the Mark the sermon series announcing Pro the kingdom. announcing the kingdom, yeah. and so I mean you talked about you know, everything we see it, it's not like we're just emulating G, what Jesus is doing, mm. um, but we're looking at and asking the question well who is Jesus yeah. in this and what is his kingdom look like mm. and and those are two important questions that we should be asking yep. throughout the, the book of Mark throughout, throughout the throughout the Gospels right what who Absolutely. is Jesus and and what does his kingdom look like yep. because then that's going to that's going to impact every area and aspect of our lives yeah. right um, yeah. and rather than going um well, he's casting out a demon here. Okay, I guess this is how we cast out demons, or, or <laughs> like this it's is a playbook. The, this is how we, you know, this is how we, yeah. you know, we can declare sins forgiven, or yep. you know, or this is how we heal. Yep. Um, yeah, it's not a, it's not a playbook, right? Mm -hmm. It it is big truths, God's redemptive story, yep. that we have to fit our lives into and mm -hmm. under that umbrella. Yeah, so. it's great. Yeah, the gospel should make us long for the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And instead, it seems oftentimes like we use it as a playbook to make mm -hmm. us no longer need Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh well, we can we can be our own messiahs, mm -hmm. right? Then we build churches with with weirdness. So stop doing that. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> so, and anything else from the sermon today? You felt like uh, it's left in the cutting room floor. Anything else you want to take up here? Things you want to speak to? Out with the old. With the new. <laughs> a fitting title. I really didn't put that. Together. I was actually thinking, like, man, that would have been great to preach next week, you know. But <laughs> would, you can, you can, you can steal that. You can, you know, just remind me. It was, it was so fun. Uh, yeah. So I'm working on this. I'm trying to figure it out. So oh, let's see, what's today? Sunday. Sunday. Uh, yeah. So yesterday, I'm in the office. I've taken out yep. the rest of my books, yep. cleaned up, and yep. I just go. I'm just going to sit in here while it's quiet. Yep. 
and work. And so I touched up the sermon. I needed the title still. And so I go, okay, what what's kind of what's going on here? Mm-hmm. And it just hit me. Mm-hmm. Okay, out with the old, in with the new. Okay. Mm-hmm. I actually put in with the new, out with the old. And I was like, oh, oh did you really? That way. <laughs> I had to Google it. And I'm like, oh. so I put the title in. And then I was thinking about out with the old, in with the new. And I came up with some of the microwave, you know, yeah. and the uh-huh. iPod yeah. stuff. Uh-huh. And I go, okay, that'll work. That'll work, whatever. Yeah. And then I go home and I come, I printed it out, you know, because I'm in the office. I print, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, this would be so great. I'll come in and be printed already. <laughs> I sit down at my little desk this morning and I look at the title and I go, oh. Whoa, what's going on here? What is the deal? It's like, I went up myself. <laughs> Lord so, sense of humor. It yeah. was, that was totally. so hilarious. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Oh. Totally. Yeah. Oh. Well, we're not kicking you out yet. You know, we're, we're not going to be gone, but no. we appreciate you being our lead pastor mm-hmm. and leading this podcast and your preaching over the years has been a blessing to many, many people. Oh. So thank you for that. It's been a pleasure, Amen. and uh, I hope uh, you, you continue with this. I'm glad. I wish we had done more more, more of this because I hope it's helpful, and I hope we get more subscribers as they really chew on the word and really, you know, ask, again, that was my thing today, ask hard questions. Mm-hmm. And, and we don't have all the answers. I want to make sure that we, this is why I like this. Well, we want to be more of a forum to push back and go, what could it be? Mm-hmm. Uh, and for those that it's clear, we want to be clear because there is clarity. But for the rest, man, let's chew on it, and let's encourage chewing and pushing uh, because either a will come to the clarity or b will just be impressed that god's glorious mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so have mm-hmm. that heart i think as you push uh, because I, it makes me i just think of some people that we have in our church have come out of religious situations where they couldn't ask questions and i go man that that's not healthy mm-hmm. if you can't ask questions then you're not worshiping a god you're worshiping a cult yeah and so uh mm-hmm. God, yeah. God can handle your questions. You know, as the biblical families pastor, mm. I, let me just say the. too. <laughs> that's the well, it, that that's what we want to encourage in our in our homes yeah. too, right? We want kids to to come up with tough questions yeah. and 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 receive those questions, and mm. um, because um, we want them to not be afraid of that. Yep. And uh, so, and just like parents, your pastors don't put on put them on the spot, and right. and don't don't live for us mm-hmm. in the spot that we got to give an immediate answer. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause some, some answers are complex. Mm-hmm. Some yeah. answers, so, so it takes time. Right. And so yeah. I think there's just, I think that's why parents just, Oh, don't, uh, I, I can't handle it. Don't ask that question. It's like it, you have time. Like, yeah. in fact, you can say, you know, that's a good question. And maybe you could say, I don't know. I need to do some research. Or you can say, you know what? I think I know, but I don't know if you're ready to understand the complexities mm-hmm. of that yet. But let's think about this, right? How can you steer conversation too? And so just be okay with not, we just live in an immediate world. Yeah. And so if you ask a tough question and you don't get an immediate answer, that doesn't mean it's wrong or it's yeah. it's unanswerable. Sometimes things need to breathe. Mm-hmm. And the question is, have you memorized the whole book yet? Because mm-hmm. once you memorize it, then maybe you can answer all the tough questions. Mm-hmm. But the, I think a lot of truth is in here. And that's yeah. why it takes time for, it takes, you know, if you didn't grow up, uh, I think about the meals that I love today, the complexities of understanding a good chef. I didn't know that when I was a baby. I was mm-hmm. eating mush peas, mm-hmm. right? I ain't eating mush peas today. And so I, I I've, uh, but it took training and it took understanding, palate development to be able to do that. It's the same thing with the word. Like, that's why I said again today, not only t- ask tough questions, but man, be in this word. It will it it will feel sometimes monotonous and sometimes sometimes glorious and sometimes like you just didn't understand it. But I'm telling you, over and over and mm-hmm. over, it's gonna build. And all of a sudden you're gonna read in Hebrews and it's gonna connect back to Leviticus and you're gonna go, Oh my goodness, I get it. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna love that day. Mm-hmm. So So keep reading, keep studying, keep asking tough questions, keep asking questions. If you've got questions, you can give them to us uh, through, our, through our app, harperquestions.com, uh, and uh, we'd love to take those up as we work through Mark and other texts and things. We just want to be helpful, like you said before. Yep. So if we can do that and serve you guys in that way, it would be our pleasure. And we'll see you next time on the Cutting Room Floor Podcast.